March. So I'm not sure if all of you are kind of in the same time warp that I am. So I, I feel privileged that you showed up here today online. Um, I am here today representing Energy Code ACE. I am an, actually an energy consultant here in Northern California. I own my company, Gable Energy. And what we do is energy consulting. So a lot of this is near and dear to my heart. We're really going to talk about how reach codes come to be and why they are something that happens in California. And um, Becky, I can't, is there a way for the, the group to let me know whether they're aware of any reach codes that are in their own cities? Do we have anyone here who has a reach code that they know has been approved in the city they work in? So people can either chat me or you can raise your, use the raise hand feature and I can sort of read out um, who from the list does. Uh, either of those will work if people want to weigh in on anything that Gina asked during the presentation. I have a tendency to ask a lot of questions. So I would love to get a raise of hands if you have, if you work in a city that has a reach code. You guys are the LA area in which there's not a ton of reach code activity in that area. LA City does have one regarding a pool roof, but does anyone else have any others that they're aware of? Raise your hand. Do we have any raised hands? So far, I'm not, uh, the city of Santa Monica does. Um, uh, yes, Santa Monica always is, is on the top of the list, yes. Yes, <laughs> and the state of Massachusetts has a stretch code. I don't know if that was supposed to be reach and is stretch or if that is a different category. It's a completely different category. Reach codes are specific to California, so they would not apply to other states, but I have to say it's nice working here in California. In case show the Susan Young, but... Hello? Um, but other states are starting to um, take on the same, um, I want to say, challenge that California has in terms of energy efficiency, and we are starting to see um, other states, such as Massachusetts, uh, especially New York, Oregon, Washington, doing things that are very similar to what California is doing. City um, of West so it's Hollywood. pretty exciting. Also, someone I'm mentioned. Sorry? City of West Hollywood also was mentioned. Oh, that's right. I forgot they were adopting one. That's, you know, there's a new one almost every day on the list, and I had forgotten about that one. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how reach codes come to be and where you can find more guidance on reach codes and be um, <laughs> on the pulse of all those new cities. I just got a list yesterday and I didn't have to say look at it and that probably West Hollywood is on that list. And we're gonna talk about how electrification has turned a corner here in California in which our energy code fully supports electrification in terms of residential construction. We're not quite there yet for high rise res hotel, motel, and non-residential occupancies, but we are there currently in this code for residential. So that's what we're gonna um, really concentrate on today. So I am Energy Code ACE. I am paid for by you, the ratepayers of California under the auspices of the CPUC. So I wanna thank all of you for paying your utility bill. And because you pay for this already, I'm hoping all of you take advantage of the resources available at Energy Code ACE. Um, almost everything can be reached through our website. It is free because you're paying for it already and I'm hoping you'll see some value in checking it out if you haven't already. I do see a familiar names on the list here of who's attending. So I know a few of you are aware of our organization. We have a series of fact sheets and resources and all sorts of fun things. And I wanted to share my two favorite fact sheets regarding what's happening for the 2019 code for residential construction. We have two main resources that we've developed to support this. The one on your left, what's changed in 2019 is very intense. So this is line by line in code. What stayed exactly the same is colored white. What was there before, but now there's new updated language is green and purple is reserved for features that are brand spanking new to the 2019 code that we've never seen before. And this was really developed to help people get up to their specifications and their uh, submittals and so forth up to speed. So we're hoping those of you who are in charge of your submittals and maybe your mandatory note blocks in your companies might use that resource. The one on the right is a lot more user friendly. So this one is using complete sentences with pretty pictures to help represent the major aspects of code that change for this code cycle. Both of these are available as a free download as a PDF from our website. So my goal for uh, our time together is to talk about what are reach codes and how are they adopted by cities. Review 
typical or what is the, the heart of the issue when we talk about mixed fuel, mixed fuels when we're using natural gas versus all electric in which there is no use of any type of gas and how that's supported in the energy code and why understanding mixed fuel versus all electric is important in this day and age and as we move forward. And we're gonna take a look at what can define an all electric building that meets the energy code. And I'm hoping all of you will walk away today not thinking at all that electric resistance will ever, ever, ever work in the energy code. So what we're gonna say, I'm gonna try and say it at least seven times during our 45 minutes together, heat pump technology, heat pump technology. And we'll take a look at what that means and how that affects design choices. And then as many resources as I could collect about helping people understand reach codes and how they interact with the energy code. I always like to get it back into a little bit about the history of why we're here. So the energy code was put into play in 1978 uh, via the Warren Alquist Act. And there's some things that were said within that Alqu this Warren Alquist Act that have set the stage of how the energy code works. One, everything has to be shown to be cost effective, that any energy code requirement will pay for itself over the lifetime of that building feature. And that's the only time it's allowed to be an energy code. And um, I have been involved in this very intense cost effectiveness evaluation for each code cycle and it's very intense. We also measure energy very uniquely. We don't measure kilowatts. We don't measure therms. We don't even measure cost like LEED does. We measure TDV, time dependent value. What time of day is that energy being used and what time of year is it being used summer versus winter and then where is it it's dependent upon where that building is in terms of its climate zone is it a hot climate zone is it a cold climate zone and then the value of energy being used is it an expensive resource and historically natural gas has been the cheapest energy source in our retinue of choices, electric, uh, electricity, propane, natural gas, and renewable energy. Uh, renewable energy used to be the most expensive, and it's not anymore. Um, but there is, there is a cost associated with burning gas that has become something that's not been favorable here in the state of California. So whereas that PDV value is very attractive in terms of a low cost energy source, it has um, cost associated with carbon footprint. So we have our 16 climate zones here in California, and I'm hoping all of you know where you're, you are. And each of these is very much unique from each other. And a lot of California is what we like to call our extreme climate zones. It gets either really hot or really cold that really dictates a higher use of energy, whether that's air conditioning or space heating. But then we also have areas in California that are coastal. I am in climate zone three. I love the fact I live on the coast. It was 100 degrees on Tuesday. It was 90 degrees yesterday. And today it is 70 because the fog rolled in. I love nature's natural air conditioning here in climate zone three. And that's what we have with our coastal climates is that the temperatures become a lot more moderate, whether that's hot or cold kind of stays in the middle. So the goals for the energy code since the very beginning was all about energy efficiency. And in fact, the Warren Alquist Act says that with each code cycle, the energy code must be more energy efficient. It is not allowed to stay static whatsoever. But there's been a lot of other goals that have been attached to the energy code that has made things very, pretty much aggressive in terms of a timeline of increasing building efficiency, such as zero net energy goals that drove us, I gotta tell you, in large part up until the 2019 code cycle. As of this current code cycle and beyond, not only will we be looking at energy efficiency, but also reducing carbon emissions. So we're gonna see how that cost of carbon is really changing how we're looking at the efficiency of buildings and also encouraging grid harmonization. As we have more photovoltaics on the system, well, they generate a lot of electricity in the middle of the day, 
when a lot of us are, well, it's kind of funny. When I say this up until March, it was a lot of us aren't at home during the day, but that's completely changed, hasn't it? <laughs> so um, the model of how are we using all this energy being generated in the middle of the day and how can we move that energy? How can we store that energy to use later in the day when it's hot, when people have their air conditioning on, when they're cooking and using appliances? How can the energy code help support harmonization of all of those systems. And reach codes have a place in this. Reach codes are when cities want to go beyond and reach deeper into some of these goals that we're talking about before the state gets there. So we're going to, I always break things down into four challenges. And we're going to first start with reach codes. And then we are going to talk about how the 2019 energy code defines a compliant residential home. It's a whole new formula we've never had before. Then we're gonna dip into what defines a mixed fuel residential building versus an all electric residential building that shows compliance to the energy code. Now, before I dive into reach codes, do we have any questions up to this point that uh, need to be answered? Hello? I'm not seeing any on the chat, but if anybody wants to jump in with a question, please feel free. Any questions? Okay, then we're gonna keep going. Let's dive into reach codes. So reach codes are local ordinances, and this is where a local government agency can choose to adopt code that's more stringent than the energy code. They're never allowed to adopt anything that backs off the energy efficiency requirements of the energy code, but they can definitely increase the stringency associated with the energy code. And these local ordinances have, I gotta tell you, up to this point, had to show that that local ordinance or reach code was consuming less energy. But we're seeing a very unique group of reach codes for the 2019 code cycle, and those are what we call all electric reach codes. So those aren't about saving more energy. They're about using different energy sources, which is has very unique from what we've seen in terms of reach codes to date. So the legal requirements behind a reach code is that it has to be compliant with all state laws. Like I said, it cannot override something that's been set as a minimum. A reach code does not get to just last forever. It is set in place with cost effectiveness studies for each code cycle. So all of these reach codes that we're seeing adopted for the 2019 code cycle will have to go through the same exact cost effectiveness study and um, petitioning to the Energy Commission for it to be enforceable uh, for the 2022 code cycle. So it mixes up the pot every three years, just like we see with the energy code. It has to be filed with the state and made accessible to the public. And there is a formal acceptance or adoption process that allows the public to have a say at multiple times throughout this adoption process. It cannot preempt any federal requirements. And this can be a little bit of a sticky point. Sometimes uh, certain cities want to say, I want 10% better than minimum I code, and I want people to do it with higher efficiency HVAC equipment. Well, that's not allowed because there are federal regulations regarding minimum efficiency on mechanical equipment to set the playing field for our manufacturers of that equipment equally across the stage of the United States. And a state nor a city can preempt those federal minimum requirements. So there's a careful balance of how do we get higher efficiency without overriding any minimum mandatory efficiency set by the federal government. So there's all sorts of different packages, I, I'll say, that are being put together. Some um, they are about that energy source, whether mixed fuel and or all electric requiring additional PV and or requiring PV for non-residential hotel, motel, or high-rise res buildings because that is currently not dictated by the energy code. Single measures like the city of LA has their um, cool roof ordinance. That is a, just a single measure that applies to new buildings of all types in the city of LA area. 
There's also um, reach codes that can be about water efficiency. So it's not just energy. It can also be water efficiency and it can also be environmental um, such as uh, car charging and or other environmental goals a city might have. There are process load reach codes that could be adopted. I don't see those happen that often, such as commercial kitchens, elevators, and escalators. Electric ready is definitely a thing. So is there any way we can make sure people are muting themselves? We are hearing some background noise. Thank you. So electric ready is about, okay, great. You're a mixed fuel home. You're using natural or propane gas for something in the home. But that means for every place you're using gas, you must set the infrastructure in place for a future heat pump technology and or induction cooking. And we'll see what that looks like when we get into what an all electric home looks like. So that cost associated with preparing the home to easily switch the appliance to an all electric appliance has to be set in play depending upon whether that city has adopted that reach code flavor for their particular city. I have to tell you, I have yet to find the city's reach code look the same to any other's city's reach code. They might be similar, but I find so far of the 50 cities that have adopted reach codes, every single one of them is unique, which can be a challenging for us who work in multiple areas throughout California on what are the requirements for this city versus the city next door? Local reach, reach codes have to start with a cost effectiveness study. It will not be approved if it's found not to be cost effective for that very specific region in California. What the reach code is all about needs to be thoroughly fleshed out. It needs to then be prepared in terms of a report that everyone can understand, of which then is introduced to the public in what we call a first reading. And that's usually done at a city council meeting. And it has to have the opportunity for the public to have a say about the reach code language. Then there also has to be a second reading, again, typically through a city council meeting in which the public has the opportunity to have a say. Then if it's gone smoothly through both of those readings, it gets submitted to the Energy Commission for approval of which then if that happens, and I gotta tell you, um, all reach codes have been adopted and I have heard from the Energy Commission, they don't plan on impeding any reach codes that any city is coming up with at this time. That um, if a city's decided that's what's best for them, the Energy Commission will agree. But it does need to be filed with the building um, state commission in terms of it being enforceable by the authority having jurisdiction in the area. So are, who are all the players in a reach code? So there's that local jurisdiction. They're going to be putting a team together to actually draft the language of what they want for their city. There is some great template language out there that has been provided through the statewide codes and standards team. And a lot of cities have been using that as a template and then making it um, unique for their city from that template language. City and county officials must provide feedback. I mean, that's just essential. And also that community stakeholder, those readings to the public, allowing the public to have a say also. And the city council and or board of supervisors must approve before it can be moved on to the Energy Commission. The Energy Commission cannot provide advice on how a REACH code is written, nor on the cost effectiveness studies that must be done at the local level but they can answer questions about the process. What do we have to do first, second, third? Can you help us understand what we need to do? And they will approve reach codes through a business meeting. Those happen monthly. The last few business meetings, we've had like 10 or 12 cities in each business meeting that gets approved. Third party assistance. There's a lot being done under the hood. First of all, starting with those cost effectiveness studies. And there are um, organizations out there, but that's what they specialize in. And so they're usually brought on board as a third party to help write the code language, figure out what's special for their city, and then support it with cost-effectiveness studies. And then the Building Standards Commission would then have to adopt it at a state level, again, for it to be enforceable. A lot of times we have people ask, well, can I, is there any incentives to help pay for what these reach codes are requiring. Now, there can be no utility incentives as regulated through the CPUC that 
incentivize meeting minimum code requirements. So you're not going to get a lot of incentive money thinking about, well, I just have to meet code. But incentives can help people go above and beyond code. And these are typically supported through the IOUs, the Investor Owned Utilities, and also SMUD through the Advanced Home Program. All those programs are a little bit on hiatus right now, just kind of like the rest of our life seems to be right now. <laughs> and we're all hoping to see soon what those programs might look like. But if you're working on a project and they're concerned about um, wanting to have go above and beyond and can they get some money to help with that, I suggest all of you reach out and find what's happening with the advanced home programs in your region. And they can at least get you in the queue and tell you about when things will start moving again. I did provide all, these are all quick links. So when you guys get your PDF copy of this after we go after, I, I think you guys will all get the ability to download this. These are all links to the IOU incentive program websites. Do we have any questions uh, up to date on how a reach code comes to be? Not in the chat. People were wondering um, if they would receive the slides, which you just mentioned, and they will get a PDF. So that will be coming um, by the end of this week. Uh, any other questions? Okay, great. I must be doing a great job or people are feeling are. like, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> okay, let's move on to how this 2019 energy code defines a compliant building with these new metrics that we have associated with a new residential home and or low rise multifamily building. This is something that's been part of the energy code since the very beginning in which we have three different ways we go about showing compliance to each individual building feature of a home. Our mandatory requirements are measures that are the same across all 16 climate zones in California because they have been found to be cost effective everywhere. Mandatory requirements are also the same whether it's new construction, an addition, and even an alteration. Many times an alteration will have a very much a different look in terms of how the energy code applies because it's a lot more expen uh, expensive to try and integrate energy efficiency measures with an existing infrastructure than it will be when you're designing it and building it for the first time. So you will always see that the energy code is a lot more, shall we say, aggressive for new construction than it will be for alterations to existing construction. Layered on top of our mandatory measures is a compliance pathway. It's very simplistic. You fill out some forms, but it's extremely rigid. Because if you cannot meet even one line item on this huge list of requirements, you don't pass. You're not compliant. And that can be very difficult. We find that many people do not use the prescriptive approach because it's just so limiting, even though it's so easy to document. <laughs> it's so tempting to always want to document prescriptively. We have prescriptive measures are measures that might look different for each climate zone. What's cost effective in a really hot climate zone that uses a lot of air conditioning is probably going to look really different than what's cost effective in a very cold climate zone when it's all about space heating. So climate zone definitely matters regarding our prescriptive requirements. It also is going to change a lot based on type of construction, new construction versus an addition versus an alteration. The performance method is an alternative pathway to show compliance to the energy code. And the performance approach allows you to trade prescriptive measures against each other. You can trade down as low as mandatory minimums. You are never, ever allowed to trade away a mandatory minimum but the code will allow you to go as bad as a mandatory minimum. An example of this is walls. The mandatory minimum insulation for um, a two by four wood wall is R13 between the studs. But the prescriptive requirement for that two by four wall in most climate zones, 90% of the climate zones, is going to be two by four with R15, an additional two inches of rigid insulation outside the framing. A lot of people want to have flexibility with the wall design. That's where we find most people use the performance approach for new construction. 
most times to get flexibility with that wall measure. But at the end of the day, that software is running that particular building at that climate zone, at the azimuth, exactly as designed. It does this virtual simulation of how that building is using energy when compared to the perfect prescriptive baseline building that of the climate zone and building type. EDR. EDR is a brand new thing for the energy code, and I'm hoping all of you can wrap your heads around EDR because it's also going to start happening for non-residential hotel motel and high-rise res in our next 2022 code cycle. So get this under your belt now. An EDR score is an energy design rating, of which a score of 100, which is based on, I got to tell you, an ICC baseline of like 20 years ago, of which California never allowed a building to be that bad. So 100 really has no value here in California. But zero represents a home that is generating as much on-site renewable energy as it's using over the course of a year. So we had a goal. I don't know if you guys all remember. Maybe I can have a raise of hands. Who can remember when we kept saying out loud, 2020 is the Z&E code cycle. 2020 is the Z&E code cycle for re uh, residential. Do we have any raise of hands of who remembers that? I don't see any. Oh, yes. Ah. There's, there's, there's one or two. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm like, ah, then they haven't been in my oh, class before. Yeah. People okay, are aware great. Of Thank and we you. have one question so, as well, Gina, if sure. you wanted to take that. So uh, Jill wants to know what software is doing the performance path calculation? There is um, one software that's produced by the state called CBEC Res. That is the infrastructure behind any other third party software such as WriteSoft, such as Energy Pro. Those are the two third-party softwares that we have available. Underneath their software, under the hood, they're actually using CBEC Res. And CBEC Res is the free state-provided software that anyone can use. There are no minimum requirements to do a performance approach, but I gotta tell you, you really wanna make sure people understand the code when they use the performance approach. CBEC Res, there's some great classes available through Energy Code Ace, of course. <laughs> we just went live with an online class, a virtual class, and uh, the instructor, Brian Selby, is fantastic. If you want to potentially dive into the world of taking on doing performance calculations yourself, but want to start with free software to minimize costs, I strongly suggest you take a class first because the um, Energy Commission is actually required to make it non-user friendly so that they don't compete against third-party software, WriteSoft and Energy Pro, and any other players that might show up in our future, of which I'm not aware of yet. But those are the only three that have been certified by the Energy Commission that can be used for residential performance calculations. So we were supposed to be Z&E by 2020. That's this code cycle. Well, guess what? The Energy Commission could not find that was cost-effective because remember, the Warren Alquest Act requires that it only becomes an energy code requirement if cost effectiveness can be achieved. So we got to, we like to recall this, the energy code called, we got as close to it as we possibly could cost effectively. So your score that's required by the state is gonna, it's gonna vary, depend on your climate zone, depends on size of building, but let's just say it's between 20 and 30. A homeowner can still choose to go to zero and or there might be a reach code that requires the score be zero for that particular region or city per their reach code requirements. But that is not something that is required at a state level. So an energy design score has two components to it. Every other, an EDR score is used throughout uh, the United States. It's not specific to California, it's a ResNet score. But what California did that, because we can't do it like everyone else does, that's just not California. We added a different flavor. And that flavor is building efficiency almost always has to stay in its own bucket. You don't get to trade PV towards getting rid of that rigid insulation on the walls. So if you want to do any trade-offs regarding the building efficiency measures, they have to be within building efficiency measures. 
So you can trade those walls against better windows. You could trade those walls against better mechanical equipment, but you don't get to trade anything in the building efficiency bucket because you're oversizing or doing something better in your second bucket. And your second bucket is called the PV plus flexibility score. And this is where PV lives because yes, for the very first time in California, PV is required for new residential construction, including single family homes, including ADUs, including low rise multifamily buildings. So the state is gonna set a minimum PV score and a, a KW size. Now the homeowner or the design can go above and beyond that, but whenever we're going above and beyond those minimum PV numbers, please be cognizant of the NEM rules, net energy metering rules of your local utility, and don't oversize it so much in which the utility will not allow you a meter that allows you to make some money with the excess electricity you're generating in the middle of the day. Um, there's a careful balance and that's why you want to get a PV contractor involved very soon in a project and in its design so everyone's feeling comfortable with the PV KW sizing and what that means in terms of the PV size, how many panels I need and where on a project that has to be done early in design. I, I just feel that's so important. And this is also where battery storage, battery storage is so incentivized, it's not even funny. One, there are a lot of great incentives out there from the utilities. Two, you can trade P, uh, KWH battery towards building efficiency. That's the one thing in the PV flexibility bucket that jumps over to building efficiency and allows you to do some trade-offs because they're trying to incentivize storage on the grid. Because remember, grid harmonization is one of those things that the Energy Commission is tasked with supporting and um, making attractive. At the end of the day, we take the sum of these two scores and that's our total final score. We are always compared to a standard building and we have to be equal or better than a standard building score, which is remember that perfect prescriptive building. So let's take it just a quick look at the PV sizing. So this is the prescriptive method. Things will look different in the performance method because the performance method is really looking at the azimuth and what is happening with that site, whereas the prescriptive method just knows your climate zone. And you need to know your climate zone. You need to know the total conditioned floor area of the dwelling. If this was a low-rise multifamily building, it would just be the dwelling unit conditioned floor area versus a single family home. It would be the entire conditioned floor area of that home. And then we also need to know number of dwelling units. A single family home would be one. A duplex would be two. A 12 apartment low rise building would be 12, et cetera. The bigger the building, the more dwelling units you have, the higher your KW requirement is gonna be. So if we use this formula and I always tell people, this is a good idea to get a feel of what the KW requirement is gonna be at a minimum. Like I said, performance will be different by about 10 to 20% depending, but this gets you a really good idea. So here I have a single family home in LA, which is climate zone nine, with a 2000 square foot conditioned floor area. At the end of the day, the energy code is requiring 2.6 kW. I don't know if you guys know this, but 2.6 kW is the smallest PV system known to mankind. And what actually is difficult is actually finding a PV company willing to come out and even think about supporting your 2.6 kW PV system. And they might go, hey, we don't, we don't put anything in smaller than five. But let's really look at what you need your PV for. Because this number only represents the load that is regulated by the Energy Commission. There's a lot of other features in the home that are not regulated by the Energy Commission. So those are all things why you wanna get that PV contractor involved early. Here's an example of using the performance method for the same exact building. And you can see now I got 2.69 kW because it's being aware of exactly what those um, HP, uh, air conditioning loads associated with the home that because that is a regulated building feature. The energy, uh, the software assumes a California flex install CFI where it sets kind of a budget. You're going to be at this orientation within this range 
and you're going to be within this tilt. And then that's what sets this KW. It's much, much better to do it from a designed PV system. But this is a way to kind of get you in the neighborhood and get a feel of what you need to do so that you can get your building permit as you continue to progress with what you're doing with your PV design. There is only one exception to PV, and that's that the roof is so shaded that it doesn't have at least 80 square feet of contiguous area that has a 70% solar fraction or more, meaning that over 70% of the year, the sun is hitting that roof so that PV production actually will pay for itself. Because remember, cost effectiveness is essential. Sometimes it can be difficult to figure out the solar annual axis. You do have to use a CEC approved, approved device. And currently right now, um, that could be an aerial satellite drone or digital image. And Aurora was approved back in March. And I have to tell you guys, I think Aurora is one of the best things since sliced bread. And I suggest all of you who are involved with new construction, check that out. It allows you to plop a PDF of your roof design into basically Google Earth and figure out your solar access. It's a pretty amazing tool. But if you cannot show that you have that solar access because there's too much shade, and this has to be shading outside the design of the home, trees, hills, other buildings, um, I always like to say a stupid roof design is not an exception. So you have to design your roof to take advantage of the solar access of that building location on the site. Any questions on how we define a compliant building in the Energy Code? We do have a question um, about, um, please address the permitted on-site, off-site location requirements for the PV panels. Say that again a little slower. Um, the permitted permitting on-site and off-site for location requirements for PV panels. Okay, so the permitting requirements are gonna depend on, on building department. I have heard of three different flavors. One, the PV permit and the home permit are two separate permits. Or two, the PV permit and the home permit are combined. You have to pull them at the same time. Because what the energy code dictates is that PV is installed and signed off on before the final occupancy permit can be provided. A third is there's a hybrid of the two where they'll allow you to get started with a kind of a, a deferred submittal for the PV. So those are the three options I've typically seen. You have to check with your local building department to see what they say. Community solar is another way to provide PV, and that means it's not on site but it's somewhere else. Community solar systems do need to be approved by the Energy Commission. Of currently, there's only one, which is in the SMUD territory, though I am aware of all the other utilities clamoring to do exactly what SMUD did. So we might have more options in which that PV allowance, KW allowance, is being dealt with somewhere else, but all the recording regarding that PV KW production has to be made available to the homeowner. You can rent or lease your PV, so you don't have to own the PV, but it either needs to be on site, and it could be anywhere on the site, just has to feed the meter that's serving the home, or it can be with an approved community solar system. Again, the only one I know of right now is SMUD. Let's get into what defines a mixed fuel home. A mixed fuel home is basically, we're saying we're using natural gas for space heating and or water heating and or appliances. Now I might be using all electric appliances but still using natural gas for water heating. Well, that's still considered a mixed fuel home. And in fact, those KW requirements we saw for PV do not include space heating nor water heating in that evaluation so that the energy code requires equal amount of PV for either a mixed fuel home or an all electric home. Because if we included space heating and water heating, all electric almost gets penalized because they're using a lot more electricity. So this was their way of making it equal and feeling the same and that cost effectiveness can be supported no matter whether they go mixed fuel or all electric. Building features that do not use natural gas, heat pump technology does not use natural gas. Heat pump technology, 
okay, I've said it four times now, and it's three more times in which I'm going to say heat pump technology. Our ventilation systems are never going to use gas. And our refrigerator, dishwasher, washing machine, and any electrical vehicles we may have are not using gas, whether it's all electric or mixed fuel. These are things that, that are off the list of what might be using natural gas. We do, if we're using a gas furnace, there's nothing in the energy code that says you aren't allowed to use a gas furnace. You just have to meet those federal minimums, which is 80% AFUE or higher. Now, there are some reach codes that are stating you either one are not allowed to use mixed fuel at all. Uh, there's a few cities that are uh, gone that direction and here in the Bay Area and the South Bay. Many cities are adopting, if you do a mixed fuel home, your compliance EDR score has to be a lot better than what you'll be allowed to do if you go all electric. So they're incentivizing all electric by not requiring a higher efficiency rating, an EDR rating, but it's still allowed. Or certain cities, it's not allowed. Our water heating, the energy code dictates that it's the baseline is a gas tankless water heater with a uniform energy factor of 81%, which is set by the federal requirements. The energy code, in addition to that, says, well, we're maxing it out at 200,000 um, BTU input. Anything larger than that kind of goes. You have to do the performance method and take a penalty for putting in a gas tankless water heater that ex exceeds that BTU input. Our appliances, our oven, our stove, even our pools and spas and our gas, our clothes dryers can all be gas. Unless you're in a city that does not allow natural gas, these are things that the energy code does not dictate whether you're compliant or not based on fuel type. So thinking about all of that and using any of that we just talked about, your building is going to be in compliance. Any questions about mixed fuel before we jump into all electric? Yeah. Yeah, this is Andres uh, from Southern California, Edison. Do you know roughly the uh, incremental on electric load from going from mixed fuel to all electric single family? Oh, it, it so depends. It so depends. And that's why I strongly suggest that a PV contractor be brought on early. Um, if they have a pool or a spa, their load is definitely going up. If they have multiple refrigerators or a fridge and a freezer, or um, there's just a, a, a char car charging. They plan to do car charging. So there's no set number. I find it very unique to each building and I haven't even seen an average. So it has to be very much dependent upon the design and homeowner's desires and or if it's production build, what it is that they're supporting, their systems are designed around. So that wasn't a great answer, but did that help? Yeah, it does. it does. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. I love it when I, got to, when I get to say there's no great answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> we have another okay. question, though somebody did provide a link that may have answered it. Someone wanted to know more about how community solar works. Um, and there was a sub question on it, which said there was originally language that required a connection at the building, but that might have been removed. So they were curious about that. So it's when the SMUD um, a petition went in to the Energy Commission for Community Solar, I really, they worked out a lot of the kinks. So the actual code language itself did not change. And, and there doesn't need to be a connection at the home. There has to be the ability for the own homeowner to know what's going on with their PV KW allowance wherever it is. So like SMUD, what they had to do is they had to come up with a way of showing on um, the homeowner's energy bill, their, their utility bill each month, that KW production of their allotments of KW wherever it may be in the state. So um, I actually find reading the SMUD proposal that was adopted is one of the best tools that you have to figure out what is it it has to do and um, what type of flexibility there is because it actually got put through its paces to see what does this look and feel like in reality. You can get all of that from the Energy Commission's website. Um, since I don't have the ability to put anything into the chat, because I don't have, I think, chat features, maybe potentially, um, email me. and uh, You guys will all have my contact information, and I will give you the direct link to all that information uh, via email if you guys want to send me that request. 
Anything else? Okay, let's move on to all electric. So all electric is not electric resistance. Not, 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 not. It's heat pump technology. Almost every day I get calls from homeowners that replaced all the equipment in their home with electric resistance and they don't know why their building inspector won't sign off. The energy code does not support electric resistance. You have to use an awful lot of electricity to produce one BTU of heat. But heat pump technology uses a little amount of electricity to produce a nice amount of heating BTU. So that is what's supported by the Energy Commission heat pump technology, not electric resistance. I'm trying not to say that too much so you guys walk away with the right word. So space heating, heat pump technology. Heat pump technology for space heating has been around for a very long time. There are some things we need to be aware of about heat pump technology in terms of design and also in terms of install. So all of you make sure you're working with an HVAC contractor who understands what's needed for heat pump technology because we have heard of some stories of things not being installed in, a, in the correct way in which you suddenly use even more energy because it wasn't installed correctly in terms of what is the primary heating source versus the secondary heating source. So make sure you have an expert. Water heating, heat pump technology was, has been around since I think, oh gosh, the 70s, but it was, they were beasts and they were expensive and they were extremely unique. But in the last 10 years, it's amazing what's happened with this technology and where it is in the marketplace. They're about the same price of a tankless gas water heater and the install cost is about the same. So to me, they're equal in terms of cost. The big difference between a gas tankless and a heat pump water heater is a heat pump water heater must have a tank. You have to have space for a minimum 50 gallon tank. The bigger the tank, the more efficient the system is gonna be. That must be considered in design. That tank cannot be outdoors unless you, you can do it in the performance method and take a pretty big hit for not having the tank indoors in a location in which it's not overheating because or getting too cold. Actually, it's all about getting too cold out in the winter time. Our appliances, now we can start talking about electric resistance if you want to, but really think hard if that's really what we want to do, because you're really increasing electric use if you think electric resistance. Induction cooking has really been what's out there to support cooking. Ovens um, pretty much are just electric out there. I keep looking to see if there's going to be heat pump ovens out there at some point. Pool and spa heaters, heat pump uh, technology has been around for quite a while, or electric resistance is a choice. Clothes dryer, heat pump technology, it has some issues and it needs to be thought about in terms of design and also making sure that there is support, that there is um, going to be uh, customer support to help with any issues you might be having with your clothes dryer. Not everyone out there knows how to work on a heat pump clothes dryer. And again, the same exact appliances that were electric in a mixed fuel home are electric in an all electric home. And any reach code out there that has an all electric desire, all electric at just minimum compliance is what you get. You don't have to be any better than minimum. Heat pump technology efficiency is based on those minimum federal efficiencies. It's what's gonna be that baseline. California code, puts on top of it some verification requirements. Because remember I said, if it's not installed right, we can actually be using more energy than we want. So refrigerant charge in most of our climate zones and airflow and fan walk draw are something that are gonna be verified by a third party HERS rater. Heat pump technology, NIA tier three is what's 100% supported by the energy code, except for in our really cold climate zones, one in 16, we really have to think hard about what we want to do with heat pump technology in our very cold climate zones because it is not doing so great when it gets below 17 degrees outside. And our cooking. If you have a homeowner who's just not feeling comfortable with induction, send them to, well, I guess you can't in this day and age. We used to send them to kitchen supply warehouses and they had showrooms and they'd let homeowners 
play, you know, cook something on it and see how they feel with it. We find most times once people get comfortable with it, they never want to go back. And there's just a lot of information out there about how dangerous cooking with gas in our homes are, which is why the Energy Code has some pretty amazing kitchen hood requirements because of that. We should be thinking twice about what we're using in terms of our cooking fuel source. I use heat pump technology and I'm in compliance with the Energy Code. Last code cycle, you had a penalty. You could not get a building to pass without a lot of trade-offs to be all electric. 2019, you use heat pump technology. You are equal to a mixed fuel home. Any questions on all electric? We have a question on water heaters. So for the heat pump water heater indoors, can you do a conditioned space or is it better to have it on the garage, balcony, or closet? What is the right location? Well, you have to think about how it works. And uh, there are basically two different types of heat pump water heaters. I'm showing you a picture here where that condenser, and that condenser is an air conditioner. Just think about your air conditioner condenser that's outside. <laughs> it's drawing heat in and converting it to cool air. And a heat pump water heater is just doing that in reverse. And it rejects cold air because it's pulling all the heat out of the air and it rejects all the cold air. And so if you have this inside your home with the condenser attached to the tank, you have an air conditioner in your house and you have to think about that in the winter time. Now there are some other heat pumps where the condenser is detached from the tank and you'll have like a little suitcase condenser outside and you have the tank inside. Now we just have to be concerned about how cold does it get in the winter time for that to work effectively. Um, I think personally the garage is the best place and it's gonna be a beautiful place to be when the temperatures get to 100 degrees like they've had this week. You're gonna to wanna to go hang out in your garage because it's gonna be nice and cold because <laughs> it's rejecting cold air. So it, it depends on the equipment type you're using and it depends on what you have available as the best design option and your climate zone. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything on chat. Does anybody else want to jump in with a question? Because otherwise I'm going to wrap up with some great sites and information to go to after today. Perfect. Okay, let's go for it. So um, Reference ACE is one of the tools we have on Energy Code ACE and I absolutely love, love, love this tool. I use it all day long. It is a site, uh, so you would bookmark it, that has the standard language, the code language itself, plus then the residential manual that was written to support that code language, the reference appendices and understanding those HERS verification measures and the U factors behind walls. It's just such an essential resource. And for those of us who are doing energy modeling, the ACM is the rules behind the software so we know what's happening every time we hit the calculate button. Everything is searchable, linkable. You can uh, do favorites. It's, I love this thing. <laughs> Here's another website I'm hoping all of you will also bookmark after today, localenergycodes.com. This is that list I told you that comes out monthly that gives us the list of all the cities and what their reach codes are, and they give you links to all the ordinance language. It's a really easy website to use, and I think it's one of the best things that happen to help support reach codes. So you're going to want to look at this at least once a month to keep up to date on this. Our website at Energy Code ACE, we have tools, training, and resources. Come check us out. And when it comes to a reach code, check with your local city what they have. I like to highlight the city of Berkeley because I thought they did a beautiful job with their two-page handout that supports what their reach code requirements are. So they are a city in which you go all electric, you're done. But if you go mixed fuel, you'll have to be 10% better for non-res, high-rise res, or hotel motel buildings and or have a 10 EDR margin better if for low rise, new, new low rise, including single family and multifamily. And then they break it down. They also are adopting um, additional environmental code requirements of CalGreen. And I just, this one page explains it all to me. And so check with your local city. Many cities are putting out great information about how their reach code looks. 
We are smack dab in the middle of developing and doing all those cost effectiveness studies for the 2022 code cycle. And I want to make sure that any of you who have concerns, who want to get involved, who think this is the best thing since sliced bread, because you as GBC is a leader when it comes to that, now is the time to get involved. Um, you can join. This is another great website, title24stakeholders.com. You go straight to the 2022 code cycle. You can sign up for just a specific measure or just all residential. Everything is being done with online webinars like this to make it super, super easy to be involved. And I'm hoping you'll join us in making sure our next code cycle is as amazing as it can be. And here is my contact information. I know I gave you a phone number, but don't really ever try to use it. I never answer the phone. Do feel free to email me though, because I am really good about answering email. Those of you who'd like to get those links regarding community solar, send me an email to gina at gableenergy.com and I'll send that out to you. And I am supported by my investor owned utilities that help pay for me to be here. That's Jill Marver, pg e Ruby Yepez at Southern California Edison, Jeremy Reef at Sempra, and um, Ray, I forget his last name, at the gas company. <laughs> I forgot to put him on this list. Any other last questions? Nothing on the chat. Does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up today? Becky, I think I'll go ahead and stop share so that you can take over. Great. Thank you so much, Gina. That was super helpful and informative. I hope everyone got um, great information out of that. I know I did and learned a lot. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to um, highlight for everyone our upcoming webinar schedule. We have lots of great content um, around everything that the green community could need, particularly buildings, but we have a series on resiliency and we have trainings coming up. So please check in um, on everything we we have here's a list here and you can access all of this through our talent portal so this is really the spot on usgbc's website where you can access any webinars and any other resources that might help make your job easier or if it's just a passion we love that too there are a few other ways you can get involved by joining a committee um, in your area of interest. Our committees do a lot of incredible work and they're the ones that really dig deep on some of these topics. So I really encourage you to check that out. And then you can also join us at the Municipal Green Building Conference and Expo. Uh, Gina will be joining us back there for more of this content. We will be going um, all virtual now for this event as the world has changed a lot since we first planned it, but we'll have lots of great content there. So welcome you to join us. And if you like this content, please consider donating to our organization. We are a very small nonprofit and we want to keep all this content going for all of you um, through these tough times and beyond. So please uh, let us know what you're interested in. We will make it happen and your donations really help support. You can donate on our website. And then finally, thank you to our sponsors who really support us year round in content and making sure that we have this platform available to uh, the broader green community. So thank you all so much. It was wonderful to have you all and uh, really look forward to connecting with you again in the future. And just a reminder that you will be sent an email uh, with the PDF of the slides and recording of the webinar for your future use. Thank you so very much, Gina and look forward Thank to you. connecting with you all again. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. Yeah, have a great week.